Okay, well, good to see everyone. I'm really glad that we can all get together today. Um, this is going to be a really interesting course because it's going to be a way for us to all take what I believe will be a, a very massive leap forward in how you construct your songs, how you perceive songwriting, and also how you approach your sessions with by yourself or when you're with collaborators. And what I tend to notice is that these are the main differences in most things between why someone is considered professional or like a specialist versus someone who is even just a natural or really good is that there's a line of perception that is usually differentiated between information. And that's all it is. It's like, you could be really good at something and then someone shows you this perspective that you didn't know. And then once you understand it, then you kind of do a leap forward. And so now every time you go into a session, you're, you're looking for that thing that you were just told because you know it's a truth. Um, and what happens is over time, as you start to learn all these truths, you internalize all of them and then become how you express and they become what you would call second nature. So throughout this entire course, my goal is to help you become second nature at something that is actually pretty nuanced. And if any of you have ever been in anything competitive, like a sport or chess, or even if you're like a, a high level painter or graphic designer, you'll know that there's a nuance to everything. And I, I'm just out of curiosity, is anyone here, let's say a specialist in something outside of music? I, if, if you are, specialist. What, what are you a specialist in? Uh, I mean, I'm working with aircraft, so I, oh, yeah. would, con I would consider myself like a specialist in maintaining the airworthiness of the aircraft, if I okay. would say so. Yeah. Okay, so would you agree that as you, when you first entered, you had a broad understanding of something, and then as the more information you learned, it became more nuanced and more nuanced and more nuanced and more nuanced, to where when you had conversations with people, you could tell the difference of their level of understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that's the same thing that happens with, with songwriting. Uh, it's just that because when we think of songs, it's such a vast theory to say, like anyone technically could pick up a guitar, write a song and say, I'm a songwriter. That's a very vast kind of barrier to entry because there's no quantification of, well, how good is the song? Did you, were you able to sell the song? Did it make an impactful moment for the listener? Is this something that people are going to remember? You have all these things that are not questions because anyone can say I'm a songwriter. Just like I can pick up a basketball and say I'm a basketball player. There's all these other things, qualifications I don't technically have to answer. I can just say it. And I think because of that, I've met many up and coming songwriters that kind of stop at a certain level because they give themselves the title. It's a self-titled, uh, let's say, uh, description that you can put on your Instagram. Anyone here can say songwriter. Why? Well, because I wrote a song. Fair enough. Was there a qualification for that song to be considered a songwriter? No. And that's why what you see on Instagram and all these, these platforms is everyone's a songwriter, producer, model, actor, videographer. Like everyone is, is all these things because there's no bar of qualification for it. There are many songs that are released on Spotify each year, but doesn't mean that many of them are good. But technically everyone who did it can call themselves a songwriter. So I think it's important for us first to establish some truths, which is we want to be a part of the top percentage in accordance with our peers of the people who you're listening to. Can we all agree to that? Okay. If we can all agree that writing a song is a fair endeavor, 
but writing a song as good as your peers is an even better one. And I would say an even better one is writing a song better than your peers. Will we agree to that? Okay. So as long as we agree to that, that already has our level of what we're planning on doing here has to be understood that all the people who are your peers had to have some sort of high level training or surrounded by people who have high level training. None of it is coincidence or luck. And I'm gonna tell you this, there's not one person that I've ever met who's a hit songwriter who's just lucky at doing it. There's not one. So if in the back of your mind, you just thought like, I'll, maybe I'll just write the song, it'll just happen, then let's just remove that. Because even if it does, you won't know how to consistently do it again. And our goal here is to be able to do it again and again and again, because that's how you'd be able to make a living. I think one of the, the misconceptions about writing songs is, um, is that it's all dependent on how good the song is. And I wanna start off this whole course and be very clear that you could have written the best song in the world right now, but if there isn't a great vocalist on it, it's not going anywhere. If there's not great production on it, it's not going anywhere. If there's not a great mix on it, it's not going anywhere. If there's not a great team to push it, it's not going anywhere. So, we are one piece of the puzzle. And that's why we're doing the 100%er course. Because I want you to be perspective. I want you to have a perspective of like, okay, I wrote an amazing song. How can I produce it? Or do I have friends who can help me produce it? And after we produce it, can we have a great mix on it? Because we need a great mix on it. And who's the vocalist on this? Do we have friends who are vocalists? If I can't sing it, do I have enough friends who can sing it? And can they send professional files to make sure the vocals are well, well recorded? And after we get done with that, do we have a team of executives that we can show this to so we can probably get it out into the marketplace? All of those things have to be part of the way you think. Because if it's just, I wrote a song on my guitar today, I'm going to put it on YouTube. It's most likely going to stop there. Okay. So as long as we're all clear on this, this course, I think will be really easy for everyone to understand because we're going to be doing nuance level understandings. So it might sound a little bit like we're def taking away the fragments of everything. We're like looking at something with a hyper lens. We're going, okay, this is a piece of the architecture that's in all songs, but let's now pull the way out the veil of it and let's look into it. And we're gonna be doing that with everything. It's the fact that when you get through this course, you in theory should be literally better than all the people around you, unless you're surrounded by hit songwriters. So you could be e able to easily explain to them in the same nuance level. Now, the important part is for me to first explain to you how we're gonna do the course, because it's important to make sure you're learning and you're pushing yourself. There's a certain, level of growth that happens where if you do the same thing you've been doing every single day, most likely you're not growing, you're just maintaining. So I don't know if anyone's ever worked out or been to the gym. And if you go there and lift the same weights every single day, you're going to maintain the same body frame. It's only going to grow once you start to push past your normal, you know, circumstances. So it's kind of like you know when someone has a certain body type, you can tell what they do. I can guarantee you, I can see someone and be like, I know what they do in the gym based on their size. If someone walks in the gym and they're massive, I know they're not just doing push-ups. It's like a, it's like a no-brainer, right? It's, it's not like, oh, they just have a really good diet. No, that guy's pushing 350 pounds over his head. Right. He's eating just protein shakes like you kind of, you know, you know, what these people are doing. Um, and in some cases they're doing steroids. So it's like another thing, a level to it, too. Once you get into professional sports, so you understand like there's. 
there's a high level of these things that are constantly pushing the growth. And then you can see someone else, let's say um, like a woman who does yoga, you can tell, you can tell it's the same routine every day to build certain kinds of muscles, certain flexibility level to it. And someone will say, oh yeah, I do yoga. You're like, that makes sense. I know you're not a bodybuilder because I know you're not doing those things to your muscles. And I'm not saying one's good or bad. I'm just saying you can tell based on the repetition of what someone does of what they're able to do. Does that make sense? Okay. So in what we're doing, we're going to be lifting some weights here. This is not a yoga class. This is the bodybuilding class. And I want you to build these muscles, which means we have to push them past what you're used to. So it's going to be a little uncomfortable on purpose. If it's comfortable, that means you're most likely not going to grow too fast. And we're trying to do this in three months. What I'm going to show you, honestly, people at Berkeley who go to school for four years do not know how to do. So you're in an accelerator right now. The people, all of you who've come here, you are in a time warp. And you will see this at the end of three months. You're gonna be like, I learned so much in three months. And then you'll talk to someone who went to college for four years and they're not gonna know what you're talking about. There's gonna be certain things we're gonna talk about even in today that they won't know what you're talking about. And there's a reason for this. When people go to music college, it's so expensive to go to school. It's like $50,000 a year to go to Berkeley. So what they have to do is they have to drag things out so they can make as much money as possible. So they can't show you all of the things in the first three or four months because then you won't keep paying. So they say it's a four-year program and then you go to school and you'll do the three months of learning this and then three months of learning that and then three months. Of learning. And all they're doing is just dragging it along. Because unfortunately, the more that you go into debt, the more you feel like you need it. That's how control works. The more that you're in debt to something, the more you feel like you need that thing. And then especially if that thing gives you a badge of honor, like here's a certificate. So you feel like you earned something. Yeah, so you spent $250,000 on a certificate. Then if you walk into a studio with someone like me and you can't do your job, and I fired so many Berkeley interns. I fired at least six Berkeley interns because they couldn't do the job. I spent more time trying to teach them. And after the first month, I realized they just didn't know. It wasn't their fault. They just weren't taught these things. They weren't taught how to be in a professional recording studio. It wasn't, it wasn't how they taught the school because that would mean that they'd actually be ready to go into the workplace. They don't teach them to go into the workplace. What I'm going to teach you here is not going into the workplace. I'm teaching you how to be competitive with people at the top. It's something completely different. I don't want you to become a worker bee. I want you to be competitive with people at the top. Totally different mindset you have to be into. So in this little bubble for three months, we're in the Olympics. You're training for the Olympics. And if you can understand that and that's okay with you, then this will be easy. If you're like, oh, I was thinking this is gonna be pretty easy because I'm used to doing a lot of easy things and everything kind of gets given to me, then this is not the right thing for you because it's gonna go over your head. And you're going to have to do certain homework and you'll be like, I don't want to do it. But I will say this. The reality about the job as being a songwriter is that I think they said there's like 1% of people in America who are songwriters who make a living. So it's important to note this. And I talked about this yesterday. I want you to have a, a real good aerial view. For every artist that you can think of, I'm sure you can probably think of 10 pop artists. For every one of those artists that you know who has a million followers, there's another hundred who you don't know who have half a million followers. And under that is another hundred that you don't know that have 300,000 followers. And under that is another hundred that you don't know who have 200,000. And under that has another hundred that you don't know. And I guarantee to challenge that effect because if, if you're like me, has anyone ever told you, like, have you heard of so-and-so? And then you've never heard of them. You look them up and you're like, they have a million monthly listeners? Has, ever if you, has that happened to you? Raise your hand. Okay. So that means the idea of what people think of fame is completely different 
from an industry where you don't know a lot of people nowadays. Even on YouTube, someone will tell me a YouTube channel I've never heard of. And then I look at 8 million subscribers. Who, who is this person? I've never heard of them. That's how vast this thing is. But also the songwriting world is super small. And that's why if you go on Wikipedia, and I challenge you all to do this for your own fun, go to Wikipedia, look at who writes a song, and then you'll see all the other songs and who everyone's connected to. It's like a spider web in the songwriting world. Now, why is it a spider web? Because the music industry is controlled by publishing companies, or the publishers are the spider webs. They connect the songwriters. What are they connecting? They're connecting people who have high levels of information and they're taking a percentage. The beauty of what we're doing here, there's no percentage to be taken. Everything I'm gonna share with you is gonna be the same exact information that everyone in the rooms that I work with as a signed writer and producer, everyone who, everything I'm gonna teach you is what they, everyone else knows. You can write with each other on your own. You don't need a publisher to connect you, which means you don't have to get 50% away of your, your life earnings. Very important at the end of the day. Okay, so what we'll be doing is breakdowns, uh, a mixture of listening to songs that won song of the year or songs that were songwriter of the year. We're gonna break those people down. We're gonna find commonalities. We're gonna find the things of the architecture of how they write, why it works. We're gonna challenge these things. We're gonna have speed writing. So you'll break into groups of like three or four. We're gonna put an idea in the group or if someone has comes with an idea, we're gonna show you processes and we're gonna say, how fast can we write a song? We'll give you 20 minutes. We're gonna do things where we have reviews of where I'll tell you certain things to look for in songs. You have to go on your own and search for songs that you like, find those patterns, be able to. We lost you, Adam. Sorry about that. My computer, for some reason, just keeps shutting down. I don't know if it's like a, needs an update again. Um, so last thing I said was we're going to do reviews of the things that you're learning. So that way it becomes how you're able to speak. Because what you'll notice in the verbiage, like how a similar we're talking about um, when you work with planes, I can tell the level of knowledge that you have in any endeavor in the music industry based on how you converse with me. And so I wanna break down what that is. When information is coming out of your, let's say mouth box,
Sorry about that, y'all. I had to get another computer because this one keeps on just crashing. Um, okay, so I think I think it crashed when I said we'll be reviewing everything. And so what that will be is at the end of each week, we're going to come back together and then challenge these things as a group. And the reason why that's important is because think of this like a science class where you get something into it, we get to go independently back or work in groups to challenge it, we come back, we get findings. Now, the interesting thing about this is if you look at all the people in this room, and more than likely it's kind of going to grow depending on the days as more people come into this course, you have a lot of evidence based on what you'll be looking up. And the evidence is going to help to support the reason why you do certain things. And I think that's the most important part. Um, because when I was first starting as a songwriter, I had no evidence based on why something could work versus why something wouldn't work. It was just constantly just writing songs and hoping that people connected with them. But as I started to learn that there's processes that always work, you start to repeat them and you start to get better at repeating them. And then you can talk about them with friends if the other friends know what you're talking about. So I'm just gonna do a quick um, glaze around the room. There's a lot of background noise. How do I cut out background noise? Isn't there like a button that does that in Zoom? On the top left. That should top left. On mine it says recording. Yeah, next to that does it say anything about sound? No. Mm -mm. Uh, you know what? It might be we'll we'll just deal with it then. That's probably a setting in Zoom that you gotta go and do. It might be in like the audio settings. But uh, okay. Well, we can manage with that then. Okay. But I don't know if that was like closing a door or anything. Okay. No, no, it's not closing a door here. Okay. Um there is, um, if you go up where uh, you can click zoom.us, um, mm -hmm. if you click then the audio tab, there's background noise suppression. Um, so you just have to kind of move up to whatever. What about um, this? Like if you're on a Mac, or um, it's at the top. If you're on like a- I just, I just hit it. I just hit it. Does it sound like it helps at all? Yeah, that suppressed it. Yep. yep. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to start off with is going to be um, what a song is. So let's go to this. So this is the very beginning of how we perceive things. And so hopefully throughout this, we're going to perceive deeper levels of understanding a song. So let's just start with the basics. <clears throat> okay, so. When we think of song, we're basically looking at a story, a conversation, or a message. That would be the information that's being delivered from you to someone else. It's going to be a story, a conversation, or a message. Now, sometimes it can be a raveling of all three, but that tends to be what it is. Does that make sense? So a story, a conversation, or a message. Now, within that, it's performed with lyric, melody, and music. So if we look at this thing as like a trifecta, we have story, conversation, message, made with lyric, music, and melody. So we're going to break down each column of what makes great lyrics, what makes great music, and what makes great melody. So let's start with lyrics. Okay. Okay, the number one thing that makes lyrics great is vivid imagery. Meaning the ability for someone to say something and you remember it because it's vivid enough. That is a very important part. So vivid imagery is one of the top things that makes something a great song. The second thing is repetition. The more that I repeat something, the more you'll remember it. A lot of choruses you'll notice have the same words over and over again. And the reason for that is to, for it to embed in your subconscious. 
It's not just because it's worth repeating. It's because it's used as a tool and repetition is a way for something to be bored into your subconscious so you can't forget it. If I was going to teach you anything, I'm going to repeat it over and over again and give you substance and context of why it works. So I don't know if you remember being a kid or I don't know if you've seen or around children, but you notice if someone says, um, the kid goes, why is the sky blue? And if the parent doesn't know, the kid will be like, but I don't understand. Like, why is it blue? Because they're looking for context. They're looking for a substantial understanding to make sense of the thing that we're pointing at. And if you've ever been around a kid who asks a lot of questions, they're like, well, here, eat this chicken. And they'll be like, why? Why should I eat the chicken? Or why should I do this? We should eat your vegetables, but why should I eat these vegetables? It's always like a substantial amount of context you have to give them. And the parent will say, well, because you have to eat the vegetables because vegetables are good for your vitamins. And if you have vitamins, then it makes you strong. And like you add all this context. The same thing happens with good songs. It's just done in a much more nuanced, clever way. And if you've ever written a song and let's say brought to a demo critique and someone said, I don't understand what's happening. It's because you forgot to talk to the other person like they're a child. You forgot to give them context. You forgot to give them substance that, that supports your song because in your mind, it was almost like, I'm talking to another adult. You should already get it, right? And I've been there too. So when I say your mind, I'm talking about myself as well. It's like, yeah, but I, I meant to say this, like, right? It made sense. And then the person usually goes, oh, well, when you tell me that, now it makes sense. You're like, oh, okay. I make, now I have to understand how to speak. And it's like, okay, well, the reason why is because a lot of times we assume that people are thinking similar to us. That's an assumption. But we know when we go into the, the real world, all the time, we're looking at people going, how would you think like that? So once again, it's an assumption we have that other people are thinking like us, but then we're shocked when people don't think like us. So we're just going to assume that no one does. And if we assume that no one does, then we'll have to give context and setting. Those two words are important, context and setting. So context, if we were to break down the word, would be con, which means with in Latin. So with texture, text. And with text is with words. So text, like how we text, and texture would be context. Okay. When we have setting, we understand location. Um, we might understand uh, spatial difference or indifference from the characters. We understand what the play looks like. You know, when you set a table, everything's in its order. It's the setting, the backdrop, there's a setting. So, and I, I said this yesterday, if I say a sentence, for instance, if I say, um, uh, I did this yesterday, I said, and then he got naked. Like all of a sudden he got naked. If I don't give you context and setting, you're free to think about whatever you want. But I said, all, and all of a sudden he got naked. If I said that happened in the middle of a high school class, You'd be like, what? Because now you have context and setting. If I said it was at a nudist retreat, you'd be like, that's what they all do. Because they give you context and setting. So based on how you have your context and setting, people can understand what the story is then about and how they should react to the story or not react. Because in one, you don't react at all. You go, yeah, that's what they do. They pay there to go do that. Sounds pretty normal. The other one is what happened to him? Was he on drugs? Was he okay? Did they take him out? Was he doing this first for exposure? Like, why would someone do that? So there's different reactions completely to the context and setting. This, the line hasn't changed still. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So these nuances and what we're playing with right now is nuance. This is like the little magic of the, the songwriting here, the context, the setting, the nuance. Okay, another thing past repetition, context, and setting is we have embedded metaphors. Embedded metaphors are, I would call like the gold and the silver that lies in great songs. Because that gives the listener some sort of value or some sort of deeper learning that they couldn't technically get without listening to your song. And deeper learnings and metaphors tend to help songs do this very impactful thing, which is they tend to stay longer within your subconscious. They tend to become more and they tend to last longer on the charts. Let me give you some examples. The song, Wake Me Up from Avicii, has metaphors all throughout it, all throughout it. Does everyone remember that song? Wake me up when it's all over, right? That when I'm wiser and I'm older, all this time I've been fighting myself. And I, like there's this metaphor, it's like boom. He goes, I've been trying to find myself. They didn't know I was lost. They didn't know I was lost. Like metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. It wins song of the year. Okay. Let's look at driver's license from Olivia Rodrigo. Beautiful metaphors. This whole thing of like, and now I drive past your house and like you could care less about me. It's my driver's license. Metaphor, song of the year. You only know your lover when you let her go. You only you only need the sun when it starts to snow. You only you only need the light when it's burning low. Metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. Biggest song they've ever had. Billion views. And yeah, there'll be another song that's like party, party, party. And it'll get 30 million. And everyone's like, yeah, but she's famous. Yeah, cool, whatever. But the songs that have the metaphors tend to have bigger impact. So once again, I'm trying to help you become competitive with your peers. And if you can write better songs than them, which means we have to focus on what actually works at the highest level, not just to get attention, but the highest level, which is metaphors are constantly embedded in the best songs. If you look at Hallelujah, Leonard Cohen, listen to the whole entire song. It's just metaphors. It's like these, these, these things that make you think in depth and just, oh, let me think a little bit deeper here. Does this make sense? Okay, cool. Um, next is using common dialogue. So the way you speak is important. I think sometimes people have this very interesting thing where they think songs are written with almost like a a poetic pen that's Adele really she's saying hello it's me that's how she talks you know common dialogue is the part yes it's not just conversational it's common, meaning you can understand it, I can understand it, someone in some other country can understand it. It's not saying words you've never heard before, because it's common. And conversational is part of it, but I'm talking about common, right? Um, so, when we review songs later, you're gonna realize that everything sounds like someone's just talking. And it's so important because that's one thing that I tend to notice with upcoming songwriters is they sing things that they actually would never say. And so there's this disconnect. 
when they're singing them, but they don't realize there's a disconnect because they're trying to be a songwriter rather than just singing what they say, which is different. And it's the reason why a lot of times when I write songs, I don't technically write songs. I just put on a microphone. I tell the producer, if, if I'm not writing a song that I've actually created, if I'm working with a producer, I say, don't let me hear the track. Just put on the microphone. I wanna walk in and the very first thing I sing is in reflection of what you have musically. I don't wanna know what you have musically. So that way I'm not overthinking what I might say. Now, if it's a song that I'm writing a guitar, I just put on the microphone and I just sing whatever I feel like saying. And I tend to notice that by doing that, I'll find chunks. So I might find one line here and one line there and then one line there. And then I'll build around that line, which we'll discuss as we move forward that, that technique of having a line then going, well, what line supports those? Let's just add a couple of those. And cool, remember this other line that was really good? Let's just put a couple of supportive lines before it. And next thing you have a whole verse done. It's very fast. Okay. Okay, so as Lucas said too, conversation. Making it feel like you're having a conversation. And that's what I'm saying. If we look at something like, um, uh, perfect example is this chain smoker song. So baby, baby, pull me over in the backseat of your Rover that I know you can't afford. Bite that tattoo on your shoulder. That's conversational. Pull the sheets right off the corner of the mattress that you stole from your roommate back in Boulder. We ain't never getting older. That's just conversational. They're just telling a story, just talking to someone. But with a good melody and with these little in-depth metaphors and vivid imagery, I know that song. I've only heard it about five times, but I know that song because of all those other pieces that we just talked about. Okay, there's usually a beginning, middle, and end. So that's important. Usually, not always, but usually. Usually, it's beginning, middle, and end. So similar to like a mini movie. Okay. Next thing is contrast. A lot of the great songs you'll notice use contrast. It's up and it's down. It's wrong with it's right. It's black and it's white. We fight, we break up, we kiss, we make up. Hot and cold. It. it it's back and forth. A lot of great songs you notice have, even that thing I said, wake me up. I was trying to find myself. I didn't know I was lost. It's just contrast. Same thing with the other song with the metaphor. You only need the light when it's burning low. You only need the sun when it starts to snow. You only know your lover when you let her go. That's just contrast back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the reason why contrast works is because it's almost playing ping pong in your brain. And while your, your brain is playing ping pong, it can't think about anything else. It can't be distracted. And if it can't be distracted, that means it's focused. Now that's a very important thing. Because if I say something that has, let's say a metaphor and your brain chews on it for a second, it might try to figure it out. And if it does, it means I've had your attention for two more seconds. And if I can land another one right after that, I have your attention for another two seconds. If I can land another one, another two seconds. So then by the end of a verse, I might've had, you know, 15 seconds of your time, but you're captured. And I do that in the verse. And then I do that in the pre-chorus. And I give you something super catchy in the chorus. So by the time the next verse comes around, you've really have, I have a minute of your time. And then I do that same formula again, just with now the middle of the story. I do that same formula again at the end with a bridge and the final chorus. And now I have three minutes of your time. Well, that's a song. That's the whole game. And if you think of it like that, that's the whole entire trick of the game. How do you captivate? Let's look at that word captivate, which means to capture attention. If you look at the word attention, you're talking about attentiveness. So if I'm capturing your attentiveness, 
if I'm taking hold of something and you are paying attention, which means you're paying with the time of your life, which I know is your most valuable commodity. It's not your house. It's not your car. It's where your eyes and your ears go. Because where your eyes and your ears go means that's where you're focusing your attention. And you're paying me with the time of your life. That's what the whole entire social media game is. Wherever you're putting your eyes and your ears, you are paying those people with the time of your life. So I'm going to say this to you. Make sure you're really putting your eyes and your ears where it's really beneficial to yourself. Because if you're not getting paid back, you're being stolen from. You just don't know it. Don't let other people steal your life. Don't be the generation that all of a sudden wakes up in their 60s and realize you didn't do shit. Other people did shit and you watched it. This is the only generation that that might happen to at a very, very high level. Because people are so focused. And other, I follow people. How many people do you follow? I follow a thousand people. Why the fuck do you follow a thousand people? So I'm saying these things because if you understand how the game is played, then you're not just a player in the game. You're a controller of your game, which is different. If you're a player in your game and you're just being led around by everyone else and you have no clue why you're doing it, then even when I tell you these things, you're most likely just going to use them in order to get attention, but not have intention. I'm telling you these things in the hopes that you'll awaken, not just to write a song, but you'll be awakened enough to use this information for something that's powerful, positive, and actually benefits society, benefits yourself, your family. Not so you can run out there and write a hit song and then talk about how much money you make and like shake your butt around and like put pictures of gold chains and stuff. I'm not telling you that for this. And I'm being honest about that because I'm hoping that by giving you this really high level information, you're going to be like, you know what? How do I help my family? How do I help myself? How do I change some stuff that I obviously is, is a bit wild out here because of the game that's being played? Okay. So these things are the basics of writing great lyrics. And the last one is a unique perspective. A unique perspective is the key piece that takes all of the things that we talked about and stamps them together. It's almost like that little stick that goes in a sandwich. You can have all the other things in the sandwich, which is good, but that little stick holds them all together. That's a unique perspective. It's something that holds it all together. Now, the reason for that, and the reason why it's so important and why I talked about it and why I say it for last is because in theory, there's a lot of artists on the top of the charts that you can interchange their songs and you would not know. They don't actually hold a truly unique perspective. It might be unique to you because there are six people in the room who wrote the song. So you're like, oh, that seems pretty unique. But it's not unique the way when you hear a certain artist, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a random artist, but like the way Lil Wayne might write a song, I know is completely different from the way Drake might write a song. It's a unique perspective. And I know the way that Eminem would write a song is like no one else. Eminem says some crazy things in his songs. No one else is gonna say stuff that Eminem says. And I know the way that Let's say someone like, uh, I'm trying to think of like a legitimate, even some of Ed Sheeran's first stuff and John Mayer's first stuff, they were writing songs. I'm like, yeah, Justin Timberlake would never say that. The people who are in their, their realm, let's say. Like the songs that John Mayer wrote, his first albums, none of the people who were around him would write songs like that. His were very introspective and had de depth and detail and all these things and the, 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 the hooks in them. There was, he wrote from a unique perspective. The more that you can write from a unique perspective, I think Billie Eilish does a great job. She writes from a unique perspective. The songs that she writes, I would never see Halsey write or 
uh, Olivia Rodrigo write or any of the other girls who are in that thing wouldn't write like Billie Eilish. She has a unique perspective. So the more that you can define your unique perspective, that's kind of the difference that's going to make it to where someone says, oh, I know that that's so-and-so song. And I think that's a very important piece that a lot of times is being removed from modern music. Because what's happening in modern music, just for everyone, if, if you're not aware, is when songwriters pitch songs, so we get a thing called a brief sheet and it's sent to us. So we'll get every single artist that's looking for a song. And it could be literally 50 to 100 artists that are on labels or publishing companies. And it says the name of the artist, what kind of album they're looking for, um, what tempo of a song, mid-tempo, uh, up-tempo. Then it says a style. They want it with disco meets, you know, freaking Neo Soul or whatever it is. And then they'll have their manager's name and their publisher contact and the due date of when they need the song by. So there'll be 50 to 100 of these people on the list. And then professional songwriters look at this list and go, do we have any songs that would fit some of these artists? And then you submit them to the managers and the publishers. So sometimes when you write a song, if you see, oh, there's a, Sia's looking for a song and Rihanna's looking for a song and so is some other artist. You're writing a song that's just blanket enough that can hit all three. So it's not a truly unique perspective because it means several of them might be able to sing it. And that's what it's become. Like for instance, any female artist with a voice like Beyonce could sing Halo and that Halo would be a great song. It's just a great song. But there's the only unique perspective is the, the way he phrased the thing of Halo. Sia could sing Halo and it would still be a great song. Because there's really nothing said in there that makes you say, oh, this must be Beyonce. It's just her voice. There's nothing lyrically that was said there, like her perspective. It's just a great written song. Does that make sense? Okay. But I guarantee when I went back and I said the thing of Eminem, there's things that Eminem has said in songs that no other rapper would even touch to say. So... All I'm doing is saying the more of a unique perspective that you have, your genuine feelings towards something. Like if you're going to write a love song and let's say you're like, I had a traumatic past, write it with that thing of the traumatic past. And then you might write it to where you came out of it, which gives a little hope or light, but that's up to you. But write it with that understanding, not just in a love song that everyone would love. Write it from your unique perspective because then it'll actually connect on a real resonation and not be a forced trite way of creating something you think everyone will just, just listen to. If you have a fear of these things, like if you have a fear of growing old, that should be in your storyline. And I think the more you become honest with yourself, not just here's a, a robotic version who just writes songs, but who are you? artistically who are you as a being where are you at in right now in your life and putting those things because it'll always change the person you are today is not the person you can be in 10 years if you if you're growing it's not going to be but in this point now right from the perspective that you're actually in and all i'm suggesting is use it with some sort of intention and good underlining it however you get there because that's your choice at the end of the day. Because what I think what people are gonna experience is if you put a lot of things into the world that let's say have a negative resonation, they tend to come back. I'm sure you're aware if you look at what's happening in the normal scene, there's like a lot of rappers who have died over the last a few years. We're talking about hundreds. You see people constantly in lawsuits. So-and-so shoots so-and-so. So-and-so gets arrested. So-and-so has gone for 20 years. This person's in a divorce over here in the pop world. This person slept with, you, if you see it, there's a certain reflection that happens. Now the outside world is like, oh, look, that person lives a wild life. But that's not how that person's experiencing it. That's their life. That's their one life that they get to experience. And if it's constantly fraught with this feeling, 
ups and downs like that, after a while, that gets really repetitive. And then that's why you see people commit suicide. When you see that up and down, it gets really, really repetitive. That's why people get a lot of addictions. They're trying to numb themselves. And I'm telling you this because I've been in the industry since I was 15. I've been in the entertainment industry. It's some capacity since 15. I've seen all of this. There's a reflection that goes out into the sphere. So if you can, try to be aware of what you put out, especially if you put out a lot of it. I'm talking about lots of songs, lots of these things. There's going to be a reflection that comes back. So try to be um, perspect, per perceptive of that. Does that make sense? Okay. And the last thing I'm going to say about this unique perspective is that you have the free will to choose to write the songs that you feel will connect with your listeners. So never, ever feel like, well, if I'm going to compete with her or him, that I have to write like this or that. Because let her fans or his fans be that. Be that. There's 8 billion people in the world. Like if we're going to get real to numbers, there's 8 billion people in the world. So even like the biggest artists in the world, they're still only gaining a tiny, 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 tiny slipper of people who are looking at them. Let's just take some numbers so you can see it. Beyonce has like 26 million subscribers on YouTube, but her last video only has 1 million views. So she has 26 million subscribers, which means they're all notified when she releases something, but there's only 1 million views on her video, which means that could be the same three, three, the same person watching it three times. Cause it's just the views. So it, cause she could have 26 million subscribers, but only 300,000 people paid attention at her last song. So it's important to note that's more about the connection you have with people, especially if you're independent because you don't have the machine to pump up your idolization yet. It's gonna be about your songs. That's why it's so important to develop great songwriting. When you have a machine, they can put music videos on you, shiny things, put you on a billboard. Everyone sees you, now they see your name. Now they think, oh, you're the queen or you're the king because you're on these things. And eventually everyone starts believing it. But maybe your songs are not really connecting to listeners. Who would know? Everyone's just knowing your name. When you're in the beginning, it's going to be all about your songs. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so that's lyrics, right? That's that's the main thing. Now, I'm sure you might find more if you do, great. But that's the basic things that we're going to focus on. It'd be vivid imagery, repetition, metaphor, common dialogue, conversation, beginning, middle, end, context, setting, contrast, a unique perspective, anything else that I didn't leave off when I was saying that that we happen to write down. But those are your building blocks. Okay, so what we're going to go do today and just focus on this is we're going to pull up a couple songs that have won song of the year or who are songwriter of the year. And we're just going to look for those things. We're just going to hyper focus on those things that we talked about. And then I'll ask you some questions and we'll go in the chat and we'll start to write some answers. All right. So um, in no particular order, I'm just going to find some songs that one okay here's a song that one Okay, so this song, actually, you know, I'm not going to tell you the title. If you know the title, keep it with you. Because lyrics is important. We're going to get into titles later. But I want to see if you can pull out certain titles, too, in some of these songs. We're in the home stretch of the high. 
times we took a hard left, but we're all right. Yeah, life sure can try to put love through it, but we built this right. So nothing's ever gonna move it when the bones are good. The rest don't matter. Yeah, the pain could peel, the glass could shatter. Let it rain. If you're hearing things, write it down in the chat. If you hear the contrast, the metaphors, baby, as they come by. Can't even mess it up. Though we both try, no, it don't always go the way we planned it, but the wolves came and went. And we're still standing when the bones are good. The pain could feel, the glass could shatter, let it rain. Cause you and I remain the same. When there ain't a crack in the foundation, baby, I know when it's gone, we're facing. We'll go right over while we stay put. The house don't fall when my bones are good. When my bones are good. So we look in the chat. All right, we said, uh, you and I were made the same common language that diverts from the house imagery to relate back to personal nature of lyrics. The imagery when the glass don't shatter, yep. The bones are good insinuating they have a strong relationship because they're going through hard times, yep. Stuck on the bones, okay, great. Uh, everyone got the good bones metaphor. And if you also think about the good bones metaphor is something that's also said in conversation. Like whenever someone goes into a house when they're flipping a home, they'll say like this, this house has good bones. So it's like a, uh, a unique perspective of something that is still common knowledge, but it gives you this little thing that is said. Has anyone heard that sentence before when someone's like, oh, but the bones of the house are good. You've never heard that? Okay. So that's, that's used with, with, uh, contracting and builders and um, anything that's like that. When we walked into a house, I used to work in construction. You would say the bones of the house are good. It, it just meant all the rafters and all the, the the pillars, anything that's in it, holding it up. Those things were good. And we can knock down these walls, but all these bones are, are, are fine. So we just put up new plaster and put up things. So that's an interesting perspective of something that also makes it feel like that, uh, that down home working person. You know, so there's even another layer of, of all that. Um, the repetition, yep. Lines I've never heard before. Yes, that's very important. A line that you haven't heard before, but now that you know it, you feel like there's a little bit of value you have because you grew a little bit by learning it. Strong visuals, yes, Lexi. Punchline, exactly, there's a punch. So when it ended, you felt the ending was complete. It's very important. We're going to be going over this when we start to talk more in depth, but that's good to pull that out already. So when it started the hook and when it ended the hook, it felt like a completion. And I call these things brackets. 
reason why I call them brackets is because you know if I was to take this to that, everything inside of it has a powerful impact. And if I just said what's inside this and what's inside that, you would understand it. Meaning I didn't have to tell you, oh, the line leading up to it meant helped it or the line after it created. No, it doesn't matter. What's ever inside these brackets, there's a beginning and there's an end. And if I just wrote, when the bones are good, the paint don't shatter, when the blow, I've never heard this song before, but I can tell you that in that bracket, there's gonna be enough information that you don't need the rest to explain it. Does that all make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I see all the, great job, but hard contrast, you're right. She said that we made a hard left, but we're all right. These little contrasts, all right? So you said entertain, okay, yeah. I'm glad everyone's getting this. So do me a favor real quick. Write down the line that you remember the most or that you think stood out the most to you that you can remember. Okay, great. So I'm seeing a lot of similar things. So if you were to guess what the title of this song is, what would the title be? Exactly. Great. Great. So everyone's getting it. The most important word of this whole thing is around bones. And that's the name of the song. I see some people connecting the dots. They're like, oh, wait a second. We took a concept, we narrowed it in more, 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 more. To the most important part, that's the title. So you can reverse engineer that same thing. Start with the title. So if someone says, hey, I wanna write a song called Bones. You'd be like, well, what do you mean? It's like, you know the thing when you go into a house and there's like good bones in a house? And someone's like, oh yeah. And they're like, so when the bones are good, like." You can mess up the house and everything. It's like a good relationship. And you sort of pull it away. Yeah, well, how can we say that in a conversation? Like, you know, when the winds come, doesn't matter. Like the glass won't shatter. Like all this stuff can shatter, doesn't matter. But when the bones are good, when you start pulling it away, and then once again, you have these, these lines and then supporting lines that get to them. Does that all make sense now? Yeah? Okay. Let's listen to another song. Now I'm starting off just right now playing songs that are like country pop. These are songs that are one song of the year in that. And we're gonna move on to pop as well. And then we'll move into some hip hop songs. Um, I want to start looking at the different genres of how they write because every genre writes similar, but there's also slightly different. So we have to kind of discern that while you're doing this. Um, but here's the next song. Same thing in the chat. You see different imagery, contrast, right? My out. buddy Brandon holds a record for single season touchdown throws. And good old Johnny keys the life of every party. It's like cheers, they do everywhere he goes. I've got some famous friends you probably never heard.
He'll flash his lights, but let me go. My boy Randy, he's a preacher. My girl Megan, she's been teacher of the year. I swear for five years in a row. I've got some famous friends you probably never heard of. Back in Hamilton County, our crowd is second to none. You might not know I'm here in this big city where Okay, great. So I'm looking at all the, the, the chat. I can see you're seeing the contrast. You're seeing the brackets now, right? Now that I talked about the brackets, hopefully it was very clear when you heard this song. And that helped you to find the title. That's when everyone started popping in the titles because you saw the brackets now. Okay. Also the contrast, you're right about this. You might not know them here in this big city and around in our small town though, these people are famous. But that's so this is the way that you're able to see these things and the conversation, the settings, the context, he gave you names, he gave you counties, he showed you all of these things. And so then as a listener, you have vivid imagery. I'm sure when you listen to a song like this, you're, you're, you're giving imagery, like these blocks of imagery each time. So these are two songs that won song of the year in the country realm. And you can see that they have a certain structure to them, All right? Okay, cool. Listen to a few more other songs. Let me pull up one that's a pop song that, that was, this is, a, I think it won, it was like Publisher of the Year Award. So this is a, one of the published songs. Let me, um, actually, you know what? I think this song actually won Song of the Year or it's one of the, the one runnings. Let me check this out. And you might know this song. It's a bit more famous than those, but let's really listen to it now with the ears that we're developing or the insights that we're developing right now. This ain't no debating on it. I'm still levitated, I'm heavily medicated. Ironic, I gave them love and they end up hating on me. She told me she loved me and she been waiting. Been fighting hard for your love and I'm running thin on my patience. Needing someone to hug, even took it back to the basics. You see what you got me out here doing? Might have threw me off, but can't nobody stop the movement. Uh -uh. Let's go. Left foot, right foot, levitating. Pop stars, do a leap with the baby. I had to lace my shoes for all the blessings I was chasing. If I ever slip, I fall into a better situation. So catch up, go put some cheese on it, get out and get your bread up. They always leave when you fall, but you run together. Weight of the world on my shoulders, I kept my head up. Now, baby, stand up, cause girl, you.
All right, hopefully you're starting to see these things. Conversation, all the words you understand. There's a word that was unique, the sugar boo. You're like, oh, I've never heard something like that before. You have the things of levitating, repeated over and over in the chorus, right? We got sunlight, moonlight, galaxies, stars. I mean, just how do we create this imagery, this context, this setting? All of it's very clear, right? So I think what's interesting as we start to break down these songs, you're going to have more truths that will hold up architecture in your mind. And as you develop them, you'll know, okay, am I using too much uh, imagery and not enough conversation? Because sometimes people do that. They'll go the whole entire song is like, well, we're talking about galaxies. So every line is like the moon and, but, and you're like, no, no, no. But where's the conversation? Just the normal common dialogue. Like, where's that part? Because they're, they're thinking too much. It's a, it's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of common dialogue. It's a little bit of the contrast. It's a little bit of so some visuals. Now it's the repetition. Like you have to kind of know when to sprinkle in the things and when it's overplayed versus when it's put in a, in a way that's satiable. Like it makes you feel like, oh, that, that was just enough of each thing. Does that make sense? I'm sure you all have, have probably even been in a room like that or you've done it sometimes. And I, I used to back in the day, I would get a concept and think everything has to be around this concept. Instead of, no, let's talk conversationally that could lead to this, but not every line having to do with something that's clever because then it just becomes, becomes too much. All right, let's listen to another song that was on the pop charts. And this is once again, was on the list of uh, songs that won awards. I think this was part of the ASCAP awards. To the wish you were here, but you're not Cause the drinks bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones here today Toast to the ones that we lost on the way Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back memories Bring back your There's a time that I remember When I did not know no pain When I believed in forever And everything would stay the same now my heart feel like December When somebody say your name Cause I can't reach out to call you But I know I will one day yeah. Everybody hurts sometimes Everybody hurts someday yeah, yeah. But everything gonna be alright Don't raise a glass and say yeah. Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not Cause the dreams bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones in day Toast to the ones that we We lost on the way Cause the dreams bring back all the memories And the memories Bring back memory
All right, cool. So I'm looking at the chat. People say cool perspective, very conversational. Feels like he's actually making a toast. There you go. The dead friends are like memories we want to bring back, of course. Repetition of melody of the do to do. Yep, yep. Um, let's see. Conversation situational context without changing the tone. Within changing the tone. Yep. November to December. So it shows time. Mm -hmm. What? Do me a favor. What was the most interesting line that you can remember out of the song? And let's not talk about the chords yet, because that would be part of the music and melody. So let's like let's talk, let's focus on lyrics. I want to do these things separately. There you go. There you go. The two people who wrote the first two lines. There you go. Well, that's a good one. Cheers to the ones that are here, but they're not. Yes, that's a cool. So when, when you say times bring back, oh, and the, where does it say times bring back memories? I would say that, uh, yeah, when you are living, you are going through things that are bringing you back, situations that you you live that maybe move you something inside. It's what okay, it's gotcha. Like. But it, so kind of like when you're talking about the line that they said, memories bring back you type thing? Is that the line? Because I'm saying what line was the one that, that felt? Uh, I, I, maybe it's a mistake. I was it, it doesn't say so in the in the in the in the lyrics. I don't I don't know. Is that one of the lines? Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um I just don't remember the line about time is bringing back the memories. I I heard memories bring back you. Yeah, maybe it's a mistake in my in my head. Okay. Um, okay, so I agree. So these are ones that that stuck out the most to me. And what's beautiful is that you all pretty much said the same thing. So my heart feels like December. That to me was the, the line that I went, that's a pretty cool metaphor that I've never heard before. And so it stands out because it has conversational, um, common dialogue. It also has a deep metaphor that I've never heard. So it made me remember it in a vivid way. All right, so that's that's one. Now, the other one is um, what you have is uh, drinks bring back all the memories. Memories bring back you, like that little dot. But it, this does this, and then this does this, and then this does this, and it all comes in a circle. I thought that was a really way good way how they they played that. And the memories bring back memories bring back you. That little that little thing, um, which also gives it this repetition in a really genius way. And the drinks bring back all the memories. And the memories bring back memories, bring back you. It's like memories, memories, memories. So the title of the song is Memories. Because once again, it's something that's a center point. And then we pull back and we pull back and we pull back. And we have all these descriptive lines. But everything is about these memories. Because he said, there was a time when I remember when I didn't know a pain. when I Or I didn't know this. There's a time. These are memories that someone had. There was this moment that we had together and i wish i could call you but these are memories so it's just one central theme that when you start to blow it up and extract it has all these really cool imagery conversation contrast metaphors repetition does it make sense okay so i want everyone to have this this moment too to understand that we just focused on lyrics today. That was the main point of just kind of opening this, this box, this Pandora's box. And I just chose three songs at random that when the last two years or a couple of years have won awards. The reason why they're so blatant to see is because the people who are writing them understand how to write songs that create this experience. Hopefully now you see you can do that too. If you can understand that's all it is, because you can see it clearly now. These people see it clearly, so they write a lot of songs like this that create an emotional engaging or a thought that you haven't had before. 
If I said, oh, famous friends, I've never thought of it like that, but you're right. In every single town, there's people that you know that the whole world doesn't know, but in that town, they're famous. Like in the town that Patrick and I live on in, Crazy Eric is famous. There, right? There's people that are famous in a sense for just being in the town. Everyone has a town like that. And so when we have this thing about, like I said, the, the good bones thing, it's like, yeah, that's what, that's what people say when they're builders or contractors. That's a unique perspective. This whole thing of memories, memory, the, the drinks, so toast, the cheers, because when we're drinking, it's when, we, when we're together at the holidays. You remember, grandma and I might be there. It's, it's when you're at the holidays, sometimes those moments when you're with a bunch of friends, and you're like, hey, remember we had all of our close friends, we haven't seen each other in years, and that other close friend passed away. That's where those moments happen. So he's gave you the setting and this context that, that are all common, that we all go through in life. So hopefully, from just this very brief kind of unveiling, this very brief just opening up and getting a chance to look into it, you're able to see that there are common patterns and, and ways of looking at a song, which start with the main title and ways to give it supportive context that then have all the other things we talked about, a unique perspective, uh, contrast, metaphors, conversation, common dialogue, setting. But that's where it starts from. It starts from that title. Any one of you, if you try to reverse engineer it now with this understanding, can kind of go back and be like, did I appease all these things? Now, what's going to help support these things are going to be obviously lyric, melody, and music. So we're just focusing on lyric today. So what I want you to do is for homework. This is the first homework of this session. Um, is I want you to look through five songs that are in the genres that you're studying. Because I want you to first focus on the genre that you're working in. And we'll move to spreading out genres, but I want you first start in the genre that you want to plan on working in the most. So if you plan on working on hip hop the most, I want you to study hip hop. If you plan on working in country the most, I want you to study country. It's EDM, I want you to study EDM. For the first part, we're going to expand, but I first want you to start with five songs that have won song of the year or have, um, have won the Grammy of the year. But it has to be like, it's the song, of it's that biggest one. Now, song of the year is within the writing society. So ASCAP, BMI, probably SOCAN, um, CSAC, uh, any, probably APRA, anything that's the, um, the, the society is song of the year. Grammy's also a song of the year. Um, so you can kind of go across the board because they're all gonna be different. And just think of these things. And I think it's best to write it down. So if you want to create an Excel sheet or like a, a notepad, you know, but title the song. And then every time that you see a contrast, and here's the best way to do it. Write verse. And then whenever you hear a contrast, just write contrast. And then you don't have to write what it is if you don't want to, but just verse, get contrast, conversation, da 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 and then pre-chorus, whatever you see in there, conversation, common dialogue, blah, blah, blah. And then chorus. Okay, I see brackets of the title, this, 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 this. And the reason why I'm saying I don't, I don't care if you write what it is, I care that you know the amount of what's happening in each. That's more important to me. So if you, or when you, finish the five songs, you'll be able to go back and look at it like a scientific algorithm and be like, okay, I notice that across all five songs in the first verse, there's setting, context, contrast, conversation, vivid imagery. Hmm. Okay. So next time I write a song, I have to make sure I have those five things in there because I want you to see it as evidence. Does that make sense? Just write verse, pre-chorus, chorus. Okay, cool. See the parts that it has. Um, you get five songs in your genre. And really, it could be 
there, there's no like it has to be in the last five years because the truth is great songs last. So, you know, if you want to look in the last five years, you want to look 10 years, I wouldn't go too far back because obviously language and, and things have changed. There's certain things that will be consistent, but I would say in the last like 10 years would probably be good. Um, and then go down to Excel sheet. And when we get back together next time, we're going to bring them up. So I'm going to call on you. We're going to break every song. We're going to look through it all. We're going to use this as a science class. Okay. There are going to be sessions. So I'm going to be teaching this every Sunday. So when you see me come back to do this, this reference, it'll be next Sunday. So we have a full week to get into that. It's important that um, everyone that you're in the club, that you look at the events page because different mentors who are going to be helping. Like I said, we have Lauren Dyson, who's a hit songwriter. We have Mary Marchetti, who's a hit songwriter. Um, we have Susan Koch, who's a great songwriting coach, who's over hit songwriters. We have a lot of mentors coming in. You're going to want to look in the events page because it's based around their schedule, their availabilities. So just keep focused on that inside heartbeat or on your calendar wherever it pops through so you can make their sessions. But mine will be every single Sunday throughout these next three months. And so we'll always do something like this where I'm going to break down something in depth. We'll rip across the lines of it. We'll have examples of it. We're going to challenge it. And then we'll give you homework. And then we'll keep doing that throughout. Um, someone asked, if our focus is instrumental, should we try this out? Yes, 100%. Because if your focus is instrumental and all you can do is make beats, then you're not going to be making too much impact as a producer once it gets to the highest level. Because the only people who are in the top sessions in the world are people who understand lyric, melody, and production. And that's a good question. So let me explain to everyone. The difference between Timbaland and Pharrell and someone who makes a beat is massive. Timbaland and Pharrell get paid $80,000 a song, even if it doesn't get on someone's record. The person who makes a beat might make $3,000. The difference before the $82,000 is their brand and their understanding of lyric and melody that makes a hit song. It's not just the track. So if you don't know lyric and melody, you're always going to stay just someone who makes beats, which means you're really not going to be paid for publishing because someone else can just buy your beat from you. And they can say, hey, I want, I want your track. It sounds good. I'll pay you $1,000 for it. You sell it. A good lyric and melody gets put on it. That song gets worth a million dollars now. You just lost out because you just did instrumentals. The best producers in the world all understand lyric and melody at a high level because lyric and melody is just like another line of instrument. It's sonic to them. So they'll go, oh, that, that line doesn't sound right. Like if you ever listen to Max Martin talk, he's like, sometimes the words don't, like I say words that don't make sense, but they sound right to me. It's because he's thinking of it like an instrument. So anyone who's instrumentalist here, please for yourself, learn lyric and melody so that way you can be equally as collaborative in a session. And you don't just like also put a track into a session and go, okay, well, there's my job. Because you might find an artist that's really good at singing, but they don't know how to write great lyrics and melody. So you might have this amazing track and you give it to them and then they sing on it. And technically they sound good, but the story is missing all these parts we just talked about. So you just put a song out because they want to, but it doesn't actually change your life. But imagine if you were able to tell them like, hey, we need brackets around this chorus. And hey, like uh, this lyric right here, like it doesn't really make sense. It's not conversational. And this part right here, like I think we can use a line that we've never heard before. And then that song that you worked on now becomes an amazing song and it helps to change your life. All right. So that makes for any instrumentalist, like I highly recommend doing this as well. It's just like another skill set that can be very powerful. Um, okay. If anyone has any questions, I have about five minutes. So banner. Yeah. So uh, can you just, uh, just explain again, what does bracket mean? Like mm. exactly. So the yeah. bracket I was talking about is where someone put the title in the first line and the back, the final line. A title in the first line and a back line and uh, the last line of a section. Yeah. Okay. Oh, interesting. So, so it could be like the last two lines of a course. Mm -hmm. It could be that too. Not okay. Okay. But when I when I'm talking about brackets, I'm talking about the first line was I got some famous friends. That was the first line, and the ending line was and I got some famous friends, and the other one was yeah. like there's got good bones on this this uh this house or whatever and the last line was like this house has good bones so those was oh, what right. i mean by like hard brackets where it's the title is the first line and the last line there are other songs okay. that don't have it that 
you know, hard, which is like um, memories bring back, memories bring back you, but memories is talked about throughout that whole entire song. So you can see if you were to look within this beginning of the chorus, end of the chorus, you could see the title because it's trickled throughout the whole thing. Right. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Sebastian. Uh, yeah. Would that be called anchors? There's a lot of them. Is it the same thing? Um, or is that different? You're talking about, uh, yeah, they could be considered anchors. It's, um, we'll go into depth about the different kinds of anchors, but I would say, yes, in that sense, you could say these are anchoring the course. So, you know, this is the beginning of the course and you know, this is the end of the course. Yeah. You, you can use it as that. I would just, the reason why I'm saying it's brackets is because if you were to take this off and just put it by itself, you would completely know what the story is about. I got you. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions before we take off? Sorry, I'm looking through all these things. Uh, Brian. Yeah. Um, so if we're looking at like song selection, should we look at ones that like have really impactful lyrics? Is like uh, if we're thinking just songs of like... that just songs that one song of the year. Okay. Yeah. So just for everyone to clarity, it's like it's only songs that one song of the year that I want you to study just because. Those are songs that were voted on by everyone. So instinctively, they were like, wow, this song beats all the other songs. And so we're going to discover why that they beat all those songs and be able to kind of use those as parameters. Cool. Okay, Akila. Hello. Um, okay. So I actually had this question earlier when you were talking about the unique perspective. Um, obviously, everyone has a unique perspective, but what do you think is a good way to like, develop your unique perspective. Sure, I think a good way of developing your own unique perspective is writing things unapologetically how you see them. That's like the first stage of it. Now, pop songs are so different. Like I said, or someone could have us like levitating. Like that's not the most unique perspective in the world. You know, it's, it's something that everyone can get into, right? It's got a cool perspective. Because you're like, oh, it's different. But it's, any artist could have sang that. Rihanna could sing Levitating and someone else could sing Levitating. So it's not such a unique perspective that's only catered to that one person. But I think if you're developing your own sense of it is really having a tone. Hold on one second. so you can you can try and um okay. and develop unapologetically the world that you see it and through that you'll create something that is unique form to yourself um and i think the more that you do that people can hear you in a song now it might not once again i said like eminem i use is a very totally vast thing and what cardi b would say is not what you know olivia rodrigo would say these are completely different perspectives but i tend to notice when as you write more material i can hear writers in songs like even amongst the builder for 100 club i can tell when someone has written a song if they were a writer on a song because i can hear their voice lyrically come through it so that's like the main thing is trying to make sure that you're seeing and saying things how how you see it and eventually that kind of comes together mm -hmm. in in your own way thank you no problem uh any other questions banner and one more point um the part where you're talking about capitate captivating attention that part i sort of missed uh some stuff you were saying can you just elaborate on that again sure well i was just saying that captivating attention is the same thing as capturing someone's time in order to right. capture someone's time, you have to give them something that they feel like they want to hear more about. So one line leads to another, leads to another in a sense that each line that they hear, they're like, oh, I want to hear more. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'll stay a little bit longer. And you can tell this, has anyone else experienced this where you start listening to a song and they just shut it off? All right, cool. There you go. Why would you shut it off? It didn't capture oh. your time. It didn't captivate yeah. you. 
Okay. So it's our jobs as songwriters to write something with enough value system that a person would go, I want to hear more about this story. It's kind of like a movie. Like I've done this before too. I watch a movie and I'm like, this movie sucks. I'm shutting it off. Yep. But the people who worked on that movie didn't know it sucked because they all spent millions of dollars. They had actors, they had lines, they had lighting, they had costumes, they had all this stuff. They had directors and editors and blah, blah, blah. And the whole time they were like, we think this is pretty good. And then you see the Rotten Tomatoes thing. It's like 32%. So it's the same thing with writing songs. Does each line or each scene captivate your attention to want to keep saying more? Yep. 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 Cool. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Brian. Sorry. Another question. Is there like a time frame for what we should be looking at? So say if I like, um, would you want to look at like the last 20 years or so? Cause um, I feel like. That's what I said. Are... I said, I said, try to do, I, I think 10 years will probably help. Um, you can do it on, but I said 10 years. It's probably the best to get what you were looking for. All right. Cause, cause I just so you all know genres, genres advance and die within 10 years. So like you don't hear metal rock anymore on the radio, but at one point that was the biggest form of music at one point. You don't hear boy bands on the radio. There's a couple ones like BTS, there's a few now in Korean pop that's coming over, but in the mainstream radio, the whole boy band craze was during those years. And it might circle back. These two things have times when they circle back. And we probably will be going into this phase right now with, with especially with K-pop because it's boy groups and girl groups. But if you look at mainstream radio also with like trap, it's like a sound that was here. It wasn't here 20 years ago. So every 10 years usually is the entrance of a new genre. And then usually by the end of that 10 years, it starts to exit it. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Okay. Any other questions? No? All right. So, um, we're gonna wrap it up today. This is the first lyric class. Um, if you have friends that you think this would benefit, just let them know this first 30 days is free. So if you have friends that you write songs with, uh, you make music with, make sure that they are attending these things. So that way, when you do collaborate with them, when you have conversations, it's not just you saying it. You all are in the room like, oh wait, we gotta make sure that we have these things together. Cause then all of your songs will start to grow and it just makes your job easier. The one thing that I'll be honest, when I when I first started uncovering all this and I would say it to friends in the room, they didn't believe it because they didn't research as much as I did. So I would say, but we should probably do this. We should probably do that. And a lot of times it's almost like trying to get people to see all this information that I knew to be truth, but because they just wrote songs at coffee shops, they just thought, well, yeah, but the songs just kind of come out, right? And they're just kind of like this. And like, no, I mean, you never know. It was all this stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. I've literally systematically seen all these facts. Like, why are we not using them? So the more of your friends around you that you all know these things as facts, then the more creative you can be with the tools rather than not knowing how to use the tools and just arguing over things that don't make sense. And next thing you know, you spend all this time on a song and yet it's missing massive pillars that you need in order to make it impactful for the listener, you know? So yeah, it's, it's important for your friends too. So let them know we have 30 days free, get them in here um, and just have them apply through the, the link that most of us all have. Uh, I'm have to hop out. Me and Rishi are doing a demo critique session, I think in like 10 minutes. So if anyone has songs that you want to get a real outlook on, uh, Rishi is awesome too. So me and Rishi will be in that session and we're going to give you as much detailed advice as we possibly can. So like I said, it starts in 10 minutes. If you're in the club, just make sure you click on the link um, and I'll see you in there for the next demo critique session. Other than that, I'll see you all next Sunday if you aren't there. Take care. Cheers, Adam. Cheers. Looking thank forward you, to seeing, seeing what you come up with too. Thank I'm looking you. forward to it. Bye. Later thank you. On.